we need to have a generational mentality, especially around our spirituality. A generational mentality, a generational way of thinking uh, really starts by acknowledging that we are in an extraordinary moment generationally. And what I know is that um, the things we wanna pass into our kids just will not happen without an intentional plan, which is why I wanna talk to you a little bit about the vision of this church. A huge part of our vision is that we wanna be a church that raises up a generation. We wanna see an increase of young people loving Jesus through this church, through the ministry of this church. We wanna see more and more young people know, see and experience the love of God in a way that radically changes their life. And if we're ever going to successfully raise up a generation in this church, uh, it will be because of our commitment to raise up a generation in our homes. You can't have that absent in our homes. It has to happen. If we're ever gonna successfully raise up a generation, it will be because we decided that Jesus belongs in our lives and in our families seven days a week, not just on Sunday mornings. Hey, we are finishing up a, uh, a teaching series this morning called Family Matters, where we have been looking at really the significance of the family, uh, trying to get better understanding of God's idea uh, for the family. And Proverbs 24, verse three, says that it takes wisdom to have a good family. It takes understanding to make it strong. I think uh, this speaks to probably what all of us want, right? We probably want strong families and we probably want good families. And so we need the wisdom of the Lord. And so in this series, what we've been doing is just really looking at the importance of the family because uh, how many of y'all know that when it comes to uh, family as we have known it, uh, man, things are shifting and things are changing. Uh, when it comes down to the family as we have known it or the biblical concept or idea of family or uh, the traditional values even, even around family, it sure seems like the family is under heavy attack. And, um, and so I want to kind of speak into that today. It feels like there's a lot of movement in culture especially to sort of um, redefine or rename or rebrand what family really is. And so we want to get down to the, to the heart of the matter and figure out, you know, like what does God really have to say and how do we hang on to those ever-shifting, ever-changing values and, uh, and make sure that we are on the right uh, path. And so this morning, I want to address some things, um, re really two, two areas. I want to I address, address some things about parenting, but I also want to address some things about how to steward our influence uh, within this younger uh, generation. And so um, I, I think it is so important that we possess a vision a spiritual vision for our kids, that we possess a spiritual vision for the young people of this church, that we possess a spiritual vision for the young people in this generation. Now, the challenge with this topic that includes parenting is that I know that it doesn't apply to everyone in the room. I get that. And, um, uh, and so before you tune me out, if uh, you are not a parent, I, I, I want to attempt to bring a message this morning that I believe, I believe uh, leaves none of us out. And uh, that, that I believe applies to every single one of us. It's a message that I believe will help give us a, a vision for the spiritual condition of this generation, okay? And, uh, and so I wanna start here in Jeremiah chapter six. Um, if you're following along or, or taking notes, Jeremiah six sixteen. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. It just feels to me like collectively we all understand intuitively that we are at a crossroads kind of moment. Uh, for sure as a society, as a culture, uh, when it comes to like the ways and the values of, uh, you know, of, of our country, of our community, it sure seems like we're at a crossroads moment. A lot of times we feel that way in our own lives when it comes down to our families, when it comes down to, uh, you know, should we go this way or that way? And it feels like every turn that there are options, every turn there are, uh, you know, opportunities for us to go this way or go that way. And scripture tells us over and over and over again that life is really full of these crossroads moments. And the wisdom of scripture here in Jeremiah chapter six is that when these moments come, that we should not keep going and going and going and going, but that we should actually stop, that we should stand, that we should look and ask for the ancient ways, that we should find the right path or the good path 
and that in doing so, we will find rest for our souls. Now, this is a lot easier said than done. Certainly is not something that we are very accustomed to in a fast-paced culture, to stop, to slow down, to look, and to ask for directions, essentially, is what this verse is all about. But Scripture tells us, like, if we would do this, if we could build this habit into our life, that we would, in fact, find the right path, that we will, in, 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 in fact, find the good way, that we will find rest for our souls. And so we, uh, this morning, I think, I think we stand at a crossroads kind of moment. I think a lot of us feel that. I think a lot of us feel the tension of the world that we are in and the times that we are facing. And if you're raising a family, I think that, that man, we all acknowledge, right, like the, the, the tension of raising a family in this kind of environment. And so as we stand and we look, as we stop and we stand and we look at a crossroads kind of moment, I believe that we will find that the right path is the ancient path. It's not the modern path. Jeremiah 6, it tells us like to stop and to look and to ask for the ancient path. And I think that if we really were to slow down and stop and look, what we will find is that the right path or the good path is the ancient path. It's not like the modern path. In other words, like I think what we all know is that newer isn't always better. And that, that you know, the evolution of the family or the way society has evolved isn't necessarily for the better, which you know, kind of sounds super antiqu- uh, antiquated, um, not in keeping with modern thinking. In fact, as we kind of push into this message this morning, let me give you this starting thought. Uh, I want to just acknowledge you know, ancient paths may sound weird to us, uh, especially at a time when culturally we are so much more concerned with enlightenment and progress than we are with learning from previous generations. Um, man, it just seems like, like we are at a time uh, where we're much more interested in, in how we are evolving as a people, um, as, as a species, than we are with learning from uh, other generations, previous generations' mistakes and triumphs. And it feels like this happens in every generation. Uh, every generation has a way of sort, of sort of believing that they know better than previous generations, that they have evolved to the point where they know so much more they have so much more intellect. They have advanced in science and technology that they just are better equipped in terms of making decisions. Um, and, and what is happening is what Theo Hobson talks about in his book, Reinventing Liberal Christianity, which is a strange, uh, strange uh, thing to even, even imagine what that is. Um, reinventing Liberal Christianity, which how many of y'all know liberal Christianity needs to be reinvented? Um, uh, he says this, He says, what was universally condemned is now celebrated. What was universally celebrated is now condemned. Those who refuse to celebrate are condemned, right? And so what he's really speaking about right here is is, uh, what it's like to live in a post-Christian context where once like like the, the values that we read about in the Bible were viewed as like the better way, they were viewed as like a higher moral ethic, they were viewed as something to aspire to, but you know, if I wasn't a believer, I, I wasn't bound by that, but I at least respected you for living that way and believing that way. Now, it, it, th- those ethics and those values don't hold the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, respect in, in the wider culture. Um, and so uh, what's going on here, what Theo Hobson is saying is that the old has really been replaced with the new, that the ancient you know, like we're reading about in Jeremiah, the ancient path or the ancient way is being replaced by the modern way. And that what we all know as we sit here today is that it has not all been for the better, has it? In fact, there's a term that was coined by C.S. Lewis that goes along with this. Uh, it's called chronological snobbery. Pretty fascinating uh, name. But chronological snobbery is an argument that the thinking art or science of an earlier time is inherently inferior to that of the present. Simply by virtue of its temporal priority or the belief that since civilization has advanced in certain areas, people of earlier periods were less intelligent. And so chronological snobbery essentially reduces the influence that previous generations can have on us today. Right? This is is like, um, another word for this is like presentism. 
um, chronological snobbery, right, uh, where we are reducing or limiting the influence that people who, who have come before us can have on us today because we now know more. We are more advanced, we're more intelligent, like we have evolved, right? We are now at the apex of human civilization up until now, and so it becomes very difficult to take our P's and Q's from people who have lived before us, especially when you go back to ancient times. We think of people like in caves and go like, what can I learn from somebody like that? If anything, they could learn from me. Like, here's how you build a fire, you know? Um, and so I, I believe this though, in spite of all that, I believe that there are actually some ancient paths or some old ways around the family uh, that we would be wise to pay attention to, that we would be wise to learn, that we would be wise to value. Because what has become new isn't necessarily for the better. Jeremiah 18, so later on in this same book, um, God says this, he says, but my people are not so reliable. Uh, how many times do we hear that in, in the Old Testament, right? My people are not reliable. They have deserted me. They burn incense to worthless idols, right? So they have fallen away. They are worshiping other gods. Look at this. They have stumbled off, off the ancient highways and walk in muddy paths. So earlier in Jeremiah, he says, stop, look for the ancient path. Find, and you'll find the right, the right way, and then you'll find rest for your souls. And here later on in Jeremiah, he says, look, my people have stumbled off the ancient paths, the ancient highways. They're, 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 they're trying to chart a new course, but what they're finding is that they are actually stuck in mud. And this is a clear warning where God is, is, is telling us, he's telling his people, don't get off my path. Don't get off my path, because when you do, life will not go well for you. <laughs> right, you'll find yourself in a muddy path. In other words, you'll find yourself in a place that you actually didn't want to end up. Isn't that what always happens? Like when we try to kind of do things on our own, when we like give ourselves over to, to, to sin or to, you know, kind of just our flesh, we, we end up finding ourselves at a destination that we never intended to end up at, end up at, right? That's just how it goes. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, look, like if you get off my path, that's your choice. But if you get off my path, you're gonna find yourself stuck in mud. You're gonna regret it at some point. And so this verse, what we see, I think it's really being played out in our world every single day, is it not? Where we see people getting off the ancient path. We see, we see people getting off, you know, veering off course and stuck in the mud. And the reality is this, it's that even though we would rather avoid the muddy paths, most of us don't. Like most of us don't. Most of us find ourselves at different times like stuck in the mud. We find ourselves in a place that we would have rather not have ended up in. And and, and, and let me just give you a little bit of a break because I think it's actually next to impossible to completely avoid the muddy paths. It's like, it's like, you know, next to impossible to never in your life veer off course. And I think that we all understand from personal experience, right, what it's like to veer off of God's path, even though we know intellectually that no other path works. That doesn't keep us from trying them out. Like we still wanna like, you know, uh, you know, uh, figure this out for ourselves. We still want our own experience. We still want to see if these other ways or paths work. And I'm just here today to, to remind us, to challenge us, to call us back to the ancient paths, to call us back to the ancient highways. And so let me just uh, really get into that and explain uh, some more of, of, of where we're headed here. If you're taking notes, finding the ancient path is not just something we do for ourselves, so just returning to like, like the way of God or returning to the expectation of God or going back to the right path. It's not just something we do for us. It's also something we do for our family and the generations that follow. When you get your life on the right path, when you live for the Lord the way you are supposed to, when we, when we align with the will of God in our life, it has an influence on our family. It starts to have an influence on people who will come after us who are not even born yet. And, and there has to be a bigger vision around your spirituality. There has to be a bigger vision around how you follow God, that it is for you, but it's not just for you. Like we don't just cannibalize, right? Like, like we, we, we don't just eat for ourselves. We, we share this, we give this away to uh, our family and we set a standard or an example. And that's why I love Psalm 78 verse four. It says, we will not hide these truths from our children we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and about his mighty wonders. And then uh, skip a verse, go to verse uh, six and seven. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. See, there's a vision here around that. There's a, you know, you wanna know why we are, are for life. I mean, 
even that we have a vision for even the ones who are not born yet, that there's purpose and destiny on every single uh, child, whether they are born or not born, and that they will in turn start to teach their own children. So it says in verse seven, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. And, uh, and so I wanna talk to us this morning, like, like what these verses really reveal is that, is that we need to have a generational mentality, especially around our spirituality. A generational mentality, a generational way of thinking uh, really starts by acknowledging that we are in an extraordinary moment generationally. We are. There's actually five generations that are living right now in the world. Like, it, it's the most ever. Like, like uh, you know, in, in modern history, like to have uh, that many generations alive at one time that, that cross over and have the ability to learn from one another and have things passed down. And, and what I know is that... Um, the things we want to pass into our kids just will not happen without an intentional plan, which is why I want to talk to you a little bit about the vision of this church. Because, you know, if you've been around for any, any length of time in the last couple of years, you know that part of our vision, a huge part of our vision is that we want to be a church that raises up a generation. We want to see an increase of young people loving Jesus through this church, through the ministry of this church, which means like an increase is more. So we thank God for what we have, but our vision is we want to see more. We wanna, we wanna see more and more and more young people coming to a point in their life where they love Jesus because of what's happening in the ministry of this church because we're leading them to a place where their lives can change. We wanna see more and more young people know, see, and experience the love of God in a way that radically changes their life. And we wanna see that here. We wanna see that at this church. How many all know we wanna raise up a generation? Come on, that's a good vision. That's a good vision. And here's what I know. Um, like that's good and, and, and there's, there's, there's some buzz phrases in there that get us excited and plan our emotions and all of that, I get it. Um, but look, if we're, ever going to be, if we're ever going to successfully raise up a generation in this church, uh, it will be because of our commitment to raise up a generation in our homes. I, like you can't have, like, you can't have that absent in our homes. It has to happen. If we're ever going to successfully raise up a generation, it will be because we decided that Jesus belongs in our lives and in our families seven days a week, not just on Sunday mornings. And, and you know, we are living at an extraordinary time. There's a lot going on with our young people. Uh, this is one of the, I, I would say, one of, one of the most challenging times to be alive as a young person. Now, you know, again, I mean, that, that, that can fit along with chronological snobbery, I suppose, a little bit. But it's true. I mean, the things that they are dealing with, the pressures, the, uh, the things they're exposed to, uh, it all is just, is just added up to being a, a very crazy, difficult time for young people to, uh, to be alive. And um, it's interesting how you can turn on the news at, at really just about any moment and find people talking about what's going on with this younger generation in schools, gun violence, the spikes in anxiety and depression. Literally, every time you turn on the news, uh, you'll find someone talking about what's going on in this younger generation. In fact, the CDC says that, uh, if you still find them credible, um, totally kidding, totally kidding, totally kidding, totally kidding. <laughs> Boom, I need somebody on the drums, right? Totally kidding. Uh, the CDC says that since uh, 2020, one in four people under the age of 30 have thought about suicide one in four under the age of 30, that 91% of young people under the age of 30 report suffering with anxiety or depression on a clinical level, 91%. Experts talk about how everything that was bad or wrong has only got up since 2020. I think we, we all kind of understand that. And I think it's safe to say that today there is a generation of young people who are struggling through life. They, they just are facing different challenges. And, and yet at the same time, we also know this, uh, that 80% of the people who decide to follow Jesus do so before the age of, 18, uh, uh, the age of 21. Like, like, like the majority of people who come to faith in Christ do so before 21, right? And so it's extremely important. What this tells us is that it's, it's extremely important that we have this next generation high on our radar, that we have a plan for sharing the gospel with them, that we have a plan for sharing the gospel with them here in our church, but we have a plan for, for sharing the gospel with them in our homes as well. Like, look, if you're raising a family, if there are young people in your church, 
may, and you've never like had a conversation with them about the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, you should. You gotta have a plan for how to introduce them and share with them the love of God and what he's done in your life and why he's worth following. And here, here's what I know. And here's what I want you to know. This church is committed to making room for more and more students to find God. Like that's, that's what, where we're at. And that's why, I mean, that, that's a huge part of the reason why we've even opened up this, this hallway over here and we've got plans for next door. Like, like we, we wanna see more and more and more students find God through this church. From young to all the way through into college, we wanna see them uh, find God. And what I've been thinking is that, you know, our students spend a lot of time at school they spend a lot of times in the, a lot of time at home, and they spend a lot of time, or some time, I should say, here at church. And and I was been I've been thinking about what if two of these places at least were intentional about making room for them to find God, like highly intentional. What if the church and the family had a uni- unity of purpose to get our students to adulthood fully and faithfully living for Jesus? How much would this improve the odds? This unity of purpose, this collaboration, this plan, this way of, of like, you know, we're, 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 we're committed. The commitment isn't just held up by the church, but it's, com- it's held up in the family as well. And we're going to see these young people, we're going to have a vision to see them fully living for Jesus into adulthood. And now the generation we're talking about, it's called uh, Generation Z. Um, I think you know. Uh, Generation Z, these are the young people born between 1995 and 2015 currently somewhere between the ages of eight and 28. The youngest generation we have now is called Generation Alpha, so get ready for that one. Uh, it's, it's on its way. There are a bunch of alpha, alpha dogs. Um, uh, good luck to every parent uh, raising an alpha. Um, generation Z, right now uh, they tell us that 74 million people in America are a part of Generation Z. 74 million people. It gets bigger when you think globally. They tell us that one out of four people in the world are Gen Zers. One out of four people. So what, what, what that means basically is that in America, we're actually quite a bit older than most countries uh, around, around, the, around the world. Our, our older people live longer is what that means. And so uh, according to the Barna Research Group, uh, it, it tells us that two out of three Gen Zers who are raised in the church, 66%, are currently expected to eventually leave the church for good and never come back. It tells us that 58% of teens today who self-identify as a Christian, teenagers in church right now who self-identify as a Christian, that they are two times more likely to eventually identify as an atheist someday. And the reasons for that they explain are are, are pretty clear. Like it comes down to uh, some disillusionment with God. Like they thought that God would and he doesn't, and so they're like, man, I, I, I thought I've been raised on a lie my whole life, or they see such uh, a, um, a conflict or hypocrisy in uh, their parents or their pastors or people who have been spiritual influences in them who, who tell them how to live their life and then aren't living that themselves. And so, I, look, those are tough, right? <laughs> like, like, oh my gosh, the odds stacked against, and I think that in spite of the decline and in spite of the odds, I am convinced that young people today really do want God. We just have to do the things that draw them to him. I'm convinced of it, that there is, a, there is an aching. You know, Ecclesiastes tells us that God has planted eternity in the hearts of man. That, they're, they're, that even, if, even if people don't want to think about eternity, even if they are atheists and they want nothing to do with God, they cannot help themselves. They are hardwired and programmed to consider eternity, to think about what comes after this life. God has put that in every one of us and it is in our young people as well. And I'm convinced that they really do want God. They just need us to do the things, to live the ways that draw them to him. And so I wanna look at uh, Nehemiah chapter four uh, with you this morning and uh, kind of continue to push in to this whole thing. Uh, the Bible, as some of you may know or, or may not know, it is not laid out in chronological order. So when you read the Bible, you know, the full sweep, cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, it is not laid out chronologically. Um, rather, it is grouped together in, into its like different literary styles. So there are like poetry books that are grouped together. There are history books grouped together. Okay, there's prophecy books that are that are grouped together. Now, if it, if it were to be laid out chronologically, right, the book of Nehemiah would actually be at the very end of the Old Testament. So um, that, that's where I want you to kind of see 
what's going on here. So at the end of, of this era, uh, the people of Israel have been conquered. They have been conquered by Babylon. They, they are uh, taken into Babylonian exile for 70 years. This is modern day Iraq. Uh, if you need to know where that is geographically. So um, after 70 years of oppression and 70 years of slavery, uh, they're finally allow allowed to go back to Jerusalem, which, which laid in ruins. So you think about how much overlaps when you read the Old Testament about when they are in Babylonian exile. And this is where Daniel uh, lives and, and ministers and his life. And so you see the overlap here. Uh, we see this uh, go on here uh, in the book of Nehemiah as well. Um, they're finally allowed to go back to Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's a city that has broken down. Um, it's been ran over. Uh, and this man, Nehemiah, he leads the charge to build back up this broken down city. Here's what Nehemiah says in Nehemiah chapter four, verse 14. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people, and I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. And there's a message there. Remember the Lord who was great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I love this verse. Like, I think it's powerful because Nehemiah is, is what he's telling them is, look, like, we're going back. We're going back to, to where our ancestors once lived. We're, we're going back to our place of origin. We're going back to our heritage. And he's telling them this isn't going to be easy, but remember who you're fighting for. He tells them to fight for their families to have a bigger vision of why we're going back, that it's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be times where you wanna give up, times where you feel like this is impossible. He says, but don't forget who and what you're fighting for. And I, I just wanna say this to you. I, I, I think that whether you believe it or not, like if you're raising a young person, you may struggle to believe this. If you got grandkids and, and you're struggling with them, you may not believe this. If you're just an, a, a spectator kind of looking at this generation, you may not believe what I'm about to say. But I believe that this generation really wants us to fight for them, that they really want us to do that. In fact, I was listening to a podcast this week uh, with Pastor Chris Hodges. He pastors Church of the Highlands in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And there's an episode on the Grow Leader podcast called Fighting for the Next Generation. And um, Pastor Chris, uh, pa he pastors a church of about 50,000 people all throughout the state of Alabama, about 25 campuses. It's, it's pretty gigantic. And uh, within the last couple of years, uh, he was uh, at a place where he was wondering if their student ministry at their church was actually as effective as uh, it looked. You know, all these kids are coming and there's all this stuff going on and, and, and it seems like on the surface things are good. But he began to just really wonder, like foundationally, is the transformation really happening? Are, are, the, are the needs being met? What's going on with young people? And so he decided to do a survey with the youth in his church where they were asked one question. Uh, they were asked this question. Uh, uh, they asked to fill in the blank of this thought. I wish my parents knew one question on this survey, they're each given like a piece of paper, everybody in the youth ministry, I wish my parents knew and fill in the blank. Here are some of the answers that came back from this survey. I wish my parents knew that even though my actions don't always show it, I desperately want to please them. I wish my parents knew how much I love them even though I don't always say it. Number three, I wish my parents knew how much I treasured their advice even when I act like I couldn't care less. I wish my parents knew how much I love holding their hand even when I acted like I was embarrassed in front of my friends. I wish my parents knew that when they wouldn't let me date that guy and I was really mad, I was really actually thankful that they were fighting for me. I wish, these are real answers, by the way. I wish my parents knew that instead of threatening to punish me, I need them to do it. Real answer. I wish my parents knew that when I saw them fight all the time, it really messed me up. I wish my parents knew that their words impact me more than any other. Things they don't remember saying have changed my life. I wish my parents knew that I desire to be more open with them about my mistakes. I wish my parents knew the evils that I face every day. I wish my parents knew the fear I hide behind my rebellion and then the last one, I wish my parents knew how hard it is to stay pure. I believe that this generation wants us to fight for them. And if we wanna fight for our families, if we wanna fight for this young, younger generation, I'm gonna share with you just some simple steps that I think we can take 
um, that, that only really have power if we will walk them out and actually do it. Like, isn't that, isn't that true of anything, right? It's like, hey, this will help you only if you do it. This medicine that, that, I, that can be prescribed for you will only help you if you actually take it. It doesn't, it doesn't help to just have it in a bottle on a shelf. Neither does your Bible help you if it's just on the shelf, right? So the, the, there's truth in God's word that will help us in terms of our family and this younger generation if we will actually do these things. And so let me give them to you, and, and they're gonna sound um, simple, um, and yet, and yet they're, they're, they're really not. Uh, number one, pray for this generation. Pray for this generation. Pray for them specifically to fear and reverence God. To fear and to reverence God. Pray for the fear of God to be on their life. Now look, the fear of God, this is not where we want them to be afraid of God. That's not what the fear of God is. Okay, so let's get that right. Like it is important for all of us to have a healthy fear of the Lord, not to be afraid of him. Like, like we wanna be as far from him as we can. The fear of the Lord is about having the highest amount of respect for God and a desire to please him with our life. So, so we really, we respect, there's this respect towards God and this desire to, to, to please him with the choices we make and the way we live. And this is how we pray for this, this generation. This is how, I, I mean, this is one of the ways we pray for the young people in our home, the young people in this church, that they would have the fear of the Lord on their life, right? That they would have a huge amount of respect for who God is and a desire to please him with their life and the choices they make. And so I wanna just challenge you to pray for them, pray over them, make sure that your kids hear you pray over them. Because if you're not praying for your kids, who is? If you're not praying for your family, who is praying for them? And I get it, like prayer sometimes can be uncomfortable and it can be something that like none of us really, you know, uh, or some of us just really, really struggle with. What are the right words? Make sure that your kids hear you pray over them. And try to instill the fear of the Lord. And you can only really instill in someone what has already been instilled in you. Psalm 34, 11 says, Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I'm gonna teach you how to have the highest respect for God and how to please him with your life, how to make choices and decisions, how to honor God with your life. And so this is what we wanna do. We wanna, we wanna teach the fear of the Lord. Pray for young people in this church, pray for the young people in your home to be surrounded with divine favor. In other words, as they're going through life, as they are, are growing up right now, they, they, that they would have moments where it's so obvious that God is on their side, where it's so obvious that God answered their prayer, where it's so obvious that like God did something they couldn't explain. Like if it hadn't have been for God, that never would have happened. Pray for those moments, that they would be anchor moments, that they would be times later on in life they would look back on and say, man, God was with me, God did this, God did that. Pray for divine favor. Favor. Pray for them to have godly friends and influences. Can I get a good amen, everybody? Pray for them to have godly friends. Pray for them to have godly influences. If you have a kid who is far from God right now, not interested in church, not interested in, 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 in carrying on your faith, pray that God would supernaturally bring someone into their life, whether it's a young person, their age, or even an adult figure, who radically loves Jesus that would be a positive influence towards the things of God. Uh, we gotta pray for them to have godly friends and godly influences. When I was a youth pastor uh, for a number of years, I used to use this quote all the time by Jeannie Mayo. Uh, she says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I love that thought, right? Like we all know this as parents, like it's such a big deal. We know this in our own life, like who you hang out, out with, who you spend your time around, uh, ends up having a direct influence on who you become in life. And I just wanna say something like, like we need each other. We talk about doing church as a family, which is another part of our vision. We talk about doing life together. Like we need each other. Like, like I think if you're, if you're raising up kids in this, in the, in, in, right now, like how I many of y'all know you come to a point where you're like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I, I, you know, I have no idea. Like this is, yeah, nothing's working. Um, right, I, I'm gonna take your phone for the hundredth time, you know, whatever. Um, you will listen. Uh, <laughs> And whatever the case, uh, we need each other. And, and I want you just to kind of kind of catch a thought. I want, I want to give you like a thought. Like, so this doesn't matter like if you're raising kids or not. This just matters if you're a believer in this church. What if we would become, what if, what if we decided to become godly influences in the lives of our friends as kids? Like intentionally. 
What if we decided to show interest in the lives of our friends as kids? What if we decided to invest in the lives of our friends as kids? Uh, man, you want to be the best friend you can be for somebody, start to invest in their kids. Um, and I would say even take it a step further, like where it is, it is appropriate and where you have permission, uh, get, their, get the cell phone numbers of, of, of your friends as kids and start to text them and encourage them like every once in a while. Take them out for coffee or ice cream. Like, like pray and invest in like your friends as kids. Like, you know, we, we, the, the nuclear family, obviously there's, there's so many values around it that we want to keep and, and we want to champion, but, but one of the problems sometimes is how inward like the nuclear family can be where it's just us figuring out our life and, you know, nothing else really matters. Have a vision for this generation beyond just the ones who are living in your home and start to invest in other uh, kids' lives. Pray and invest, pray and invest. You know, you know why? Like my favorite people are the ones who love my favorite people. Pray and invest. We wanna pray for this generation. You got it? Okay. Number two, very simple. If you wanna successfully fight for your family, you have to prioritize church. You just got to. And I know I'm the pastor, and I know, I know, I know that I'm, if you're here right now, you're essentially my, uh, you know, my echo chamber. Um, you gotta prioritize church. Um, so for those of you at home, um, you have to prioritize church. It's important to have your kids in church. It's very, very, like physically here, okay? Physically here. We have to fight against the habit of missing church. You gotta fight against the habit of missing church. Um, let me just say it this way. I'm gonna give you a couple, couple, couple thoughts. And, and I know, I know I'm, I'm, yeah, this can be uncomfortable for some people, but that's all right. I got the microphone. Um, <laughs> like a wedding singer quote, I'm about to... Um, <laughs> You will listen to every word. We got to fight against the habit of missing church. Um, let me just say it like this. When you miss church, make sure it's for legitimate reasons, not just because you wanted to stay home one morning. Um, we have this kind of expectation with our leaders here at the church, with our elders, with our deacons. We have this expectation with those who go through our foundations class on our staff. We have this that we say, look, like, you, 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 when you miss church, like, let it be because you're either sick or you're on vacation, but, but refuse to get into a habit where, you know, you're just, you're just gonna take a Sunday off. Just don't feel like it. Don't wanna, don't wanna, let me, let me tell you something right now. Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision. In, in, in other words, like, it's not a decision you make, up, you make when you wake up one morning and see how you feel. You make that decision well before. This is a value. This is who we are. This is what we do. And I'm gonna get myself and my family into church. Being here at church matters, even though you can watch online. Like, I get that. I know there are those who are watching online. But you know the reason why we even offer that, you know, is, is, is strictly for people who are sick and for those who are shut in. We, we don't offer church online because we, we believe that this should be an alternative to being uh, in person at church. Like, we don't believe that at all. Like, in fact, I, I've wondered if we should just stop offering it because it's not meant for that. It's meant for those who are sick and it's meant for those who, who physically cannot come to church. Uh, which thank God that we can offer that for them. And here's why, like, here's why church, being here at church matters, even though you can watch online, because you need way more than just a sermon. You need more than a sermon. You also need a hug, okay? You also need to be able to feed off of someone else's energy as you're standing next to them in worship. And you're like, I don't got it today, but they got it. And all of a sudden, three songs in, I'm like, oh man, something's shifting in my heart because I hear their energy. I see them. I see they're going after Jesus and it's spurring me on to do the same. Like, we need this. And, and the, other, the other thing I would just say to you, like your whole family needs to be blessed, not just you. Meaning that even though you're blessed by a sermon you can watch online, that doesn't mean that your kids got what they needed that day. And they need to be in church. They've got to be in church, um, yeah. I just need an amen. You can't get an amen? Okay, 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 okay. Uh, look at this thought with me. Who and what you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. Who and what you, you expose your children to will shape who they become 
and what they believe. So this is why I just, I, I just think, hey, expose them to the presence of God and the power of God in church. Like, like expose them to that over and over and over again until Christ is formed in them, like we talked about last week. Over and over and over again until Christ is formed in them. Look at Luke chapter four with me. This is about Jesus. It says he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. As was his custom. And so I just wanna say this, like 10, 20 years from now, your kids are talking to someone, what would they say was your Sunday morning custom? How would they answer that question? And I just wanna tell you, like you gotta make, we gotta make church a priority. Jesus' parents made this their custom, right? And, and even later on, uh, we find him going back into the house of the Lord, we going back into the synagogue. Studies have shown when it comes to the influence one family member can have on the rest of the family coming to Jesus, that if the mom comes to Christ and starts going to church regularly, 18% of the time, other family members will come to Christ as well. 18% of the time. Studies show that if one of the kids in the home comes to Christ and starts going to church regularly, that 22% of the time, their parents will come to church and get saved as well. That's pretty good. But studies show us that if the dad is the one who sets the standard, if the dad is the one who comes to Christ, starts going to church regularly, starts bringing his family to church, that 94% of the time, the entire family will serve Jesus. That's crazy. And it speaks to the influence over this generation that God has given fathers to steward. And we need our fathers to just radically step up. Hebrews 10 says, hey, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Unswervingly, unshaken. We're locked in. For he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Right? So there's obviously people getting out of the habit of gathering with other believers. It says, let's not do that. Let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. It's hard to stay faithful to Jesus. Like we need each other. You come here today and it's like, hey, don't give up. Like we got this. He's coming back someday. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be okay. And so my challenge is like, hey, be faithful. Be faithful uh, you know, with Sunday morning worship as a family. Faithfully attend. Faithfully uh, get involved in life groups as a family and do that. Faithfully find a way you can serve together as a family in your church. Uh, man, you wanna, you wanna start to fight for your family. I think, I think prioritizing church is a good place to start. And then number three, um, you wanna fight for your family. Start to participate in the development of the younger generation. So this is where it's not just about prayer, it's about participation. And what this means is that regardless of whether or not you have kids, this is where you intentionally put yourself in a position to influence this younger generation. So it could be through leading like a small group with our youth ministry or with our children's program on Sunday mornings and, and Wednesday nights. It could be coaching a little league baseball team. I don't really care. It's getting yourself, like planting yourself in, in, in a place where you can influence young people in this generation. And make sure you do more than pray. Make sure you participate. I, I think about from my youth, those who participated in my own development, I think about how so many people, in addition to my parents, had a profound impact on my life. I know there's a lot of you who could say that as well. Like, like there, 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 there were like different coaches, teachers, youth pastors, youth leaders, my parents, or uh, my friend's parents. I remember being over all these different houses and having positive influence from, from my friends' parents, my grandparents, my uh, aunts and uncles. And, and these are all people who helped participate in my own development. And, and so we need to be people, whether we have kids or not, it doesn't really matter, who participate in um, the development of this younger generation. 2 Timothy 3.14 says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. I love it. Just be influenced. Man, I'm not trying to sound too old-fashioned here, which sometimes... Is, is what it's like to be a pastor. Like, hey, like ancient paths, like, you know, like, let's not forget, you know, it sometimes feels like very much like uh, super antiquated that I gotta get up here and tell you and remind you, and, and, and it, it's not in keeping with what's going on in culture, but like, man, we cannot allow Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok to raise up this generation. 
we must actively participate ourselves. And the way we do this, and I'm gonna give them to you fast, is number one, you develop an authentic faith. Like a real authentic faith. And so just by mentioning that there is something called an authentic faith would suggest that there is also something called an inauthentic faith, and there is. Because there are still a whole bunch of people who have yet to figure out that there is more to God than just Sunday morning. The most important thing you can do for yourself, you want, you, want, you want some good advice? The most important thing you can do for yourself, your marriage, your family, is get close to Jesus. You want to come to me, like, talk to me about, like, issues in your marriage? Man, get close to Jesus. Like, let that be, like, the first, like, how are you in God? Like, like, honestly, that would be, like, my number one question. I'm not an expert counselor. You know, I'm, I give pastoral counsel, and then if it's beyond what I can do, I'm like, hey, uh, we're going to refer you off. That's pretty complex. But, you know, like, when, if you come to me, uh, number one, I'm like, how are, you, how are you and God doing? Let's talk about that first, right? And that has to be like, like on our minds. Like if, if the best thing we can do for our families, our marriage and all that stuff is get close to Jesus. Um, look at this thought. Your children don't just become what you say, they become what they see. They don't just become what you say, they become what they see. And if we're not people who are serious about our faith, how can we expect our kids to be? Our lives are, are, quite frankly, a living illustration. It's a living illustration. Many times I've had people in our church, this church, come up to me on a Sunday or a Wednesday and tell me that they saw me the other day when I was out and about, when I was shopping or driving. They just like, couldn't get over to say hi to me. And I'm always like, man, I sure hope I was like, was I, I'm like, was I living all right? Like, 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 was I like, was I road rage or like, what was going on, you know? And uh are they seeing me live my life well uh, when I think no one's watching? There's always kind of that thought. Like, you, I mean, you just, you just, you think you are, you try to, but we all have moments, right? And, and look, our families are the same way. We're a living illustration. People are looking at our life. Young people are looking at us. It's a living illustration. And I know that we aren't perfect, but we are a living illustration of the kind of relationship Christ wants to have with people. And we, will need, to, we need to model this well. Look at this, this thought with me. There are young people in your home, at church, and in our community who are paying attention to how important your faith really is to you. So develop an authentic faith. Worship God with all of your heart. Refuse to live one way on Sunday and another way Monday through Saturday. You know, um, man, I want you to think about how every single day of your life, there are young people who are watching how you live your life and if you really believe what you say you believe. And let's have an authentic faith. Amen? Joshua 24, Joshua 24, 15 says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Like, you don't wanna serve God? Fine, who are you gonna serve? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Number two, um, man, beyond just developing an authentic faith, you gotta make yourself available, which means making time in schedules that are jammed. Um, I'm gonna give these fast. Um, I read an example of a dad who uh, filled a jar with marbles, put it on his dresser. Each marble represented one week. All the marbles together represented the number of weeks that were left before his kids left home. Number of weeks that remained. And so every Saturday would come and he would take one marble out of the jar and there'd be one less week until uh, his kids were, were to leave home, and it would remind him that he's running out of Saturdays. And I just, I, like, what if you had a jar in your home, or what if, what if we had a jar in our church? You know, like, like think about that. It represented the number of, of, of Wednesdays and Sundays we had left to influence the young people in this church. Like, what if we actually understood more the urgency that time is running out? We don't have forever Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Again, I'm just gonna start giving you slides. Uh, here's this. Uh, we can't force our children to love God. Wish we could. But we can expose them to people and experiences that will increase the likelihood of their spiritual growth. So we intentionally put them in environments that are gonna contribute to their growth. And we just gotta be people who, who do this, who intentionally make ourselves available, who make ourselves available, who give time, and who invest in our family. So what does it mean to invest in your family? A few practical things. 
Um, that means that if they need counseling, you get them into counseling if it's, ne- if it's needed, right? Like, like you invest, like it doesn't matter what it costs. And I know people who, who've had kids who uh, needed, needed to go into like rehab or needed some serious help and they have literally like they've taken out mortgages against their house. They've, they've done whatever it took. They didn't care if they lost all their wealth. They cared about investing and making sure that their kids got everything that they needed. Not more than they needed, let's be clear, okay? That's ridiculous too. But got what they needed like because we're gonna invest in our family. We're gonna, I, I, know, I know of a family right now I'm thinking of um, that I have spent plenty of time with and their family went through unthinkable like, like tragedy and difficulty and they had to cash in 401ks like to pay lawyer bills and, and to get therapy going on. And to this day, right now, God has given back everything that they had lost and then some. They just started to invest in their family. Like, hey, we're gonna do this the right way. It doesn't matter if we don't have what we need when we get to retirement. We're gonna trust God by doing what's right right now. You wanna invest in your family. What was the last book you read on how to be a better husband, a better wife, or a better parent? Was the, what was the last podcast you listened to about how to be a better parent, a better, a better husband, a better wife? You gotta develop goals and make them the priority of your family. And then number three, uh, I just want you to start to speak well of them. I want you to let like, positivity come out of your mouth regarding young people in your home and young people in this generation. Don't roll your eyes about them. Don't, don't stop saying, you know, this generation, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're so this, they're so that. Be positive about them and their future. I want us to declare that this generation will be a generation that wants God. That regardless of the statistics and the things that we read about, like this will be a generation of young people that wants God. That the young people in my home will be young people who want God. I'm gonna declare that. I'm gonna believe that. I'm gonna speak that. Make, make your personal vision for them that they are gonna be young people who want God, declare it and participate in making that happen. Romans 4, 17, uh, Abraham is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. So what Paul's saying here is he's saying, look, like, 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 like the God of Abraham, our forefather, like he is this God who brings dead things back to life. He's the God who does the impossible and he's the, things, he's, he's the one who calls things that are not as though they are. In other words, he sees what no one else sees. And that's what a vision really is, is you start to see things that no one else sees. This is, this is what, it, what it means to sometimes be a pastor in people's lives is I'm up here and I'm trying to see things for you that you don't necessarily see for yourself. That's the job of like a Christian dad, a Christian mom. That's the, that's the, that's the job of a, of a Christian uh, adult in the church that we start to see things over our young people that they don't see about themselves. You have to have a vision for this generation. And look at this thought. When it comes to this generation and when it comes to your kids, don't just say things as they are. Say things as they could be. In other words, stop saying like your kids are only as they are. Start to see them, like start seeing them only as they are. Start seeing them as they, as they could be or as they will be. Like even when it comes down to discipline, like, you know, I, I know this is what you did. I get that. Don't, but, but I want you to understand, I know that this is not who you are and this is not who you're becoming because I have a bigger vision for you. My heart isn't just motivated by your behavior. Like I am motivated by like the vision of God that is for you and on your life. You with me? Have a vision of who they are becoming. Have a vision of who they are becoming. And so we wanna have an authentic faith. We need to prioritize church. Uh, I'm sorry, we need to have authentic faith. We need to make ourselves available. We need to speak well of them. We are the ones responsible for calling out their greatness. And here's how we do it, especially when they mess up. You say something like, man, I've, I've never loved you more than I do right now. And you've never needed me more than you do right now. And we're gonna get through this as a family. We're gonna get through this together. This is what we would say to anybody who came into the office and needed help here at the church. Never loved you more than I do right now. Because I'm not motivated by your behavior and you've never needed me more than you do right now, we're gonna get through this together. And you do this in your home as well. There is a truth that God has had to remind me of from time to time. That he has had a different vision of me that I've even had of myself, or or a different vision of me that even maybe other people have had of me. Um, Where God has had to say to me and remind me, I know this is what you did, but that's not who you are. I know that's what you did, but that's not who you are. Where God has had to remind me that 
you're my man. You're called by me. You're called for me. You're called to serve me. You're not what you have done. There is a man of God inside of you, and it's time for that man of God to, to stand up. And there is a truth. There's a truth about the way God sees you, the way that God sees our young people that we have to declare and speak over them. And so let's not only be motivated by behavior, let's be motivated by a vision of who God has made our young people, our kids to be. Amen? Would you stand up with me? I got one more thought, one more, one more, one more verse, but you look like you needed to stand. Um, <laughs> would you just throw that up there, the last one? just says it's time for the people of this church and the parents of this church to see in our young people what they can't see in themselves, to tell them what we see in them and to start investing our time into that vision. That's what, it's time for that, right? To go after a generation, to fight for it, to love them well, to believe that there's incredible days ahead and uh, because family matters, family matters. And uh, we are a family. We do church as a family, but you also have your family. Man, and it's time to be serious and to take, uh, man, make serious decisions about what that's gonna look like and how we are going to give our kids of this church the best odds possible for loving Jesus well into adulthood for the rest of their life. Would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? I, um, I want us to sing this song together. I know, I know you gotta go. But I want you just to, instead of me just praying over you, which I love to do, I want you to start to just take these lyrics of this song and start to just pray them over yourself, over your family, over our church family, and over the young people of this church. Would you just do that? Would you treat this, these next few minutes just as very holy, very reverent, prophetic even, that you're declaring things that are not as though they are, like Paul tells us to in Romans? And would you just, would you start to come into agreement with God's vision, God's thoughts, God's ideas for you, for your family, for the young people of this church, and for the more young people that aren't even here yet.